Now, in response to the fall of the Soviet Union, huge changes took place throughout South and Central America. The first big change is that economic neoliberalism, which is a drastic reduction in social programs and the role of the government in the economy, escalated. What had already started in Pinochet's Chile and somewhat in Argentina during the 1980s spread throughout the entire continent. In Bolivia, the oil and actually the water of Bolivia was sold off to American corporations. So it was actually a crime in Bolivia if you collected water on your roof. They were stealing from like Nestle or Coca-Cola, like American companies. Um, in Venezuela, most of the revenue from the state-run oil company stopped actually going into the public budget. It basically just went to American corporations. They were getting all the profits from Venezuela's supposedly nationalized oil company. Um, and as a result of that, uh, garbage collection kind of stopped in a lot of areas. You couldn't get your garbage collected. Now, the electricity in a lot of neighborhoods would just go off for weeks because the government didn't have enough of a budget to actually pay to, to keep the electricity on. And that, that all over South and Central America, you got these, these really free market extreme policies that were being implemented. And very famously, Milton Friedman of the Chicago School of Economics, who was the one who was associated with these policies, he famously said that the, his enemy in Latin America was not Karl Marx, it was Juan Perón. And he was referring to the fact that there were these large kind of social democratic welfare states that were aligned with the United States that were not communist that had sprung up during the Cold War. And he wanted to get rid of that. He wanted all the countries of South and Central America to be completely unregulated free market countries. Um, and that, that it was no longer necessary to, to allow these countries to develop more, more social democratic systems. So that was the first big change that happened in Latin America after the fall of the Soviet Union. The second, though, is that the military juntas and the Bonapartist dictatorships that had sprung up during the Cold War, they started to loosen up because there was no threat of communist revolution. So, you know, this idea that you needed to have an absolute military rule, that started to fade away. And that there were a lot of sections of the ruling classes of these countries that did want things to be more loose. And so the communists had been protesting for democracy and for free speech and things like that. All of a sudden, throughout South and Central America, they had a lot of allies among the richest people in countries like Chile and, and Argentina and Colombia, for example. All of a sudden, they had a lot of allies who wanted to have a more liberal democratic model and not have an absolute military dictatorship because there was no need for it, because there was no danger of communist revolutions happening. So at the same time you have economic neoliberalism spreading through South and Central America, you also have you know, the, the free elections taking place. And suddenly, you know, under, under, you know, it used to be there were times in these countries where if you so much as said that you were a communist or were caught with a communist lethal, you could be killed. Well, now suddenly they're having free speech and they're having free elections. So based on that, the communists of South and Central America drastically reoriented their tactics, right? During the 1970s and 80s, Cuba and other socialist countries and various communist parties throughout South and Central America had been pushing for guerrilla warfare. You know, they had the Tricontinental Congress that was in Cuba, and you had the FARC in Colombia, you had various armed groups throughout South and Central America that were encouraging people to take up guns and try and wage some kind of rural people's war or Che guevara -ness kind of thing. Well now, as these countries were moving toward, you know, toward more of a liberal democratic state, and at the same time that economic neoliberalism was devastating the urban areas, instead of being in the countryside and trying to organize some kind of armed uprising in the countryside, the communists started operating in the urban areas and building united fronts against neoliberalism and cuts in social spending. Uh, for example, I went to one neighborhood in Caracas in Venezuela, and they talked about how in the 1990s the electricity wouldn't come on for weeks. Uh, so the, the local church and the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party and local people that weren't involved in any party, they organized a strike. So everyone in the neighborhood didn't go to work until the, the power came back on. It was understood that everyone who lives in this area, they're not going to go to work until the power comes back on. And lo and behold, the government had to then turn the power back on. They talked at one point, the garbage wasn't being collected in this particular neighborhood. So the Communist Party started collecting all the garbage, and they took it and they dumped it on a major highway and they poured gasoline on it and they lit it on fire. And so, lo and behold, the government started collecting, collecting the garbage. And uh, basically the idea was to build a coalition against neoliberalism and against the IMF and the World Bank, which were loaning money to these developing countries and then mandating that they completely gut their public sector, right? Um, so, you know, they, they basically polarize these countries between, you know, are you for, are you for neoliberalism and the cuts in social spending, or are you against it? And there are a lot of very wealthy people in Latin America that were against it, right? Because it was devastating the local economies. 
A lot of the people that owned big, had big corporations in Venezuela, for example, they were being put out of business by American corporations that were just coming in there, and they wanted the Venezuelan government to protect them. They had an incident in Venezuela called the Caracazo, and that was after there had been cuts in government funding for public transportation. They were forced to raise the cost of public transportation drastically. The people went out and rioted and rebelled against it. It was after that you had a Venezuelan political figure known as Hugo Chavez who attempted to carry out a military coup uh, and overthrow the government uh, in response to these cuts in social services. Now it failed, he was then thrown into prison. And Hugo Chavez, interestingly, did not call himself a socialist at that point. He said he was against both capitalism and socialism. He was for what he called the third way, which would be do the government doing whatever was best for Venezuela. It would be neither capitalist or socialist. He went to prison in 1992 got out of prison and announced that he would never never try to overthrow the government again, never engage in violence, but instead he would, he would build a political party. And so they built a new political party called the Movement for a Fifth Republic. Um, and it was a very popular political party, again, not advocating socialism, uh, advocating the third way, what was best for Venezuela. He got elected, he won the election in 1998, took office in 1999. Shortly after Hugo Chavez was elected, there was huge mudslides in the country. A lot of homes were destroyed. And so Chavez, being a former leader of the military, he got on television and he said that, that he was sending the military to help the people who'd been afflicted by these mudslides. And then he called on people all throughout the country to be patriotic and to do everything they can to pull together to help their brothers and sisters who'd been, you know, had their homes destroyed by these mudslides. And Doing that had never been done in Venezuela's history. The military had never been mobilized to go and rescue people whose homes had been destroyed by a natural disaster. And, and a lot of people really responded to this and were deeply moved to have the president of their country encouraging them to go out and volunteer and help people. You can remember a couple years later after 9-11, George W. Bush got on TV and said, if you want to help the victims of terrorism, go shopping. Well, Chavez wasn't telling people to go shopping. In fact, he had them organize uh, these things called Bolivarian circles in their neighborhood, where they would coordinate volunteers to go into the area. And the whole country just got kind of, you know, worked up into this, this, this fit of patriotism. And they just, they just loved what Chavez was doing. And so then, in the aftermath of this mudslides incident, Chavez got the country to ratify his new constitution. And Venezuela changed its name to the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. It was the fifth republic in Venezuela. A new constitution was created. Um, he actually had a TV program called Hello President, where he got on TV every Sunday and he took calls from average citizens, he answered their questions, um, and lo and behold, uh, he became very popular. After 9-11, uh, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, he showed pictures on his television program of innocent children who'd been killed by the bombs in Afghanistan. He said, you know, obviously 9-11 was a horrendous crime. But it doesn't justify the killing of these children in Afghanistan. What George Bush is doing, invading Afghanistan, it was actually the Saudis who did 9-11, this is wrong. Um, shortly after that, Chavez then appointed a member of the Communist Party to his cabinet. Because the Communists had been so key in getting Chavez elected, he appointed one of them to be in his cabinet. So then in 2002, there was an attempted military coup against Hugo Chavez, and the rank-and-file soldiers rose up and put Hugo Chavez back into power. Shortly afterwards, 2003, Chavez announced that the country was moving toward what he called 21st century socialism. Um, and, and they became a lot closer with Cuba. Uh, Chavez changed the nature of the state-run oil company so that all the profits from Venezuela's oil would go into the public budget. He then started using the money from the public budget from this oil that was being sold to build free health care clinics. He brought in Cuban doctors that would give free health care clinics to people in low-income areas. He also brought in Cuban literacy teachers to wipe, and he ultimately wiped out illiteracy in the country. Um, uh, when 1998, when Chavez was elected, Venezuela at that point only had 12 public universities. Today it has 32. Uh, he used the oil money to build these public universities. He also started uh, you know, funding uh, small businesses and enabling people in Venezuela to start their own businesses. Um, and he built these things called uh, colectivos or communes, which are kind of cooperatives and, and areas where people kind of held things in common. And, and lived. And shortly after that, you had Bolivia taking a very similar transformation. Uh, in Bolivia, there had been a wave of protests and strikes by miners. Uh, there had been a mass movement calling for the natural gas to be nationalized and the profits from the natural gas to go into the public budget. And uh, just as you know, the election of Chavez in 1998 was a referendum on neoliberalism, the election of Evo Morales, that was also considered to be a referendum on neoliberalism. And he also passed a new constitution in 2008 the Morales government built a massive amount of roads throughout the country. In Bolivia, there's a lot of sections of the country that had no roads. So he 
you know, use the public budget to start building roads. Um, they bought, uh, they brought electricity to parts of the country that had never had it before, and they started providing assistance to small farmers. Um, they regulated the price of food and fuel, um, and poverty has been greatly reduced. They nationalized the oil and natural gas, um, and it's interesting to note, you know, Venezuela has been having quite a few problems lately. But actually, the highest rate of gross domestic product growth in South America in 2018 was in Bolivia. It was the Evo Morales government has actually presided over the highest rate of economic growth. Um, when Morales was first elected, 16% of the people of Bolivia were illiterate. Um, but now UNESCO confirms that at this point Bolivia has no adult illiteracy. They, they've cured adult illiteracy. They also opened a huge number of hospitals. A similar situation happened in Nicaragua. You had the Sandinistas, right? They led the revolution in 1979. They led the country through, throughout the Civil War in the 1980s. They'd been voted out of office in 1992. Well, in 2006, they ran for office once again. They were elected, and they eventually joined Nicaragua with Bolivia and Cuba and Venezuela in what they called the Bolivarian Alternative of Latin America, or the ALBA Bank. The Sandinistas, they oversaw huge reductions in poverty. They created a state-run bank that started lending people money. Um, they had a policy of actually enabling people to be what they called micro-entrepreneurs. That's to start their own business, uh, but they would get a subsidy from the state. It, just like in Venezuela, they had the Bolivarian circles. In Nicaragua, they have these things called citizens' power councils. The community is mobilized, they distribute food, and they've overseen an overall increase in the living standards. And actually, in 2016, the World Happiness Index of the UN said that Nicaragua had the highest rate of happiness growth of any country in the world. It was in Nicaragua. And uh, they're also, at this point, working with China. China is pouring a lot of money into Nicaragua to build a new canal that would counter the Panama Canal. So the United States kind of, sort of, has control over the Panama Canal. They could block it off in some kind of military situation. Well, now China is working with the government of Nicaragua to build a canal through Nicaragua. It would be an alternative to the Panama Canal. There's a pattern that plays out. There's like four things that happen. First, the election takes place as a referendum on neoliberalism, with communists, social democrats, and domestic capitalists unifying into a single block against world, the World Bank, the IMF, and domination by U.S. and Western corporations. Then, a huge state apparatus is created for the purpose of stimulating the economy, with the state ultimately controlling revenue and subsidizing corporations and ultimately controlling them that way. Three, uh, you have the creation of a mass movement in the country to support the state's agenda and carry it out on a local level. And then four, the state overall begins setting the economic agenda for the country and planning the economy. So that's, that's section three on the Bolivarian Revolution uh, in Latin America.